Amen. Oh, Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Talk of the Titans live from London, UK, all the way to the US of A but and worldwide. Okay. Oh my God, I can't wait for this show. This show is going to be an absolute bangers. I apologize for the wait, everybody, but finally we're here. Um, it's taken us, you know, almost a year, all right, to get my good brothers from the Bay El their team to uh, make another reappearance on Talk With A Titan show. I'm sure you've seen, okay, we've done a multitude of shows and you've, you've always known the shows to be jam-packed with number one information jam-packed here with just with just pure laughter and humor and the reason why it's just laughter and humor because we're now finally exposing certain things that other groups and other communities do not want other people to know they like to keep other people in the darkness they like to keep other people in ignorance but finally the light is here baby finally the truth is here baby Hak ya ali all day long <laughs> hey listen this is what you need to do right can you like hit up the like button because every single like button that you guys now donate is going to do what it's going to destroy a hater it's going to destroy a nawasib that's what's going to happen baby so let's do it hit up the like button show your love show your support to uh the bait al Qadir team and show your love and support to titans tv all right, yeah, but this show is called Temporary Marriage Underneath the Microscope. We're gonna be going through uh, quite a lot of things, right? We're gonna be going through the whole motto. What is this motto stuff that we're hearing about? What is the temporary marriage, um, you know, from the Sunni and the Shia perspective? Um, we're gonna be going to the social dynamics of, of uh, temporary marriages. We're gonna go through to the religious aspect of it as well. And we're gonna just be asking some real pertinent questions and we're gonna be del delving into some, some sources I'm sure a lot of you guys may not be aware of. So I wanna get this show popping right now. So first of all, family tree, right? We've got the whole Beit El Ghadir team. They're here with us. I know the instruction is gonna be long, so I don't want to do that right now. What I want to do is just get straight into the information and afterwards we kind of just, you know, we'll, we'll come back and we'll get to know the Titans. So what I want to do right now is get an introduction, right? We're going to get a straight introduction to this actual topic, why it's so important, why we need to hear this. And we're going to give you an outline of what we're going to be discussing throughout the whole um, presentation itself. Each speaker will um, identify themselves to you guys so you know you know, who's there? Who's your favorite, right? Is, is, it, is it the mad scientist? Is it the mad scientist? Said Ali up in the building. Is it the mad scientist? Let us know. Oh, man. We've got Shadi. Oh, listen, we've got Shadi up in the building. I'm missing my brother. Oh, and Ferdus. Ferdus here is the man that I go to all the time, right? We've also got um, Ryan. Oh, man, my Australian brother's up in the building, right? You know he'd be dropping that heat on Facebook, yeah? Just jump onto his Facebook, you know the type of heat he drops. But I don't want to introduce everybody right now, but that's going to take too long. I want to jump straight into this and, um, you know, pass it over to the first person to kind of give us an introduction to this topic itself. Come on in, family, come on in. Who's the first one to introduce the topic? Hey, how you guys doing? All right, good. <clears throat> just introduce all right, so my name is Shadi Sayed. Um, I'm here to present the topic of muta marriage, kind of familiarize you guys with the uh, the topic and why it's so important. And what's this whole muta marriage? Is, is it something immoral? Is it something moral? Is it something that Christians and Jews also have within their law, within divine, natural law? So we're going to talk about everything and take everything into account. This discussion is not just for Muslims. This discussion is also for non-Muslims. So uh, let's uh jump into it so before we begin as i understand it many of you listening are not muslims so i would like to ask that if anything is unclear in the introduction that you further contact a shia channel on youtube or look up and research the discussion online if any of this piques your interest some of the terms used may be unfamiliar to you as non-muslims so whenever i use an arabic word i'm going to translate it into english so that you can understand what I'm talking about. I just don't want to use all these terms and you're just sitting there scratching your head like, what is this guy going on about? So Zawaj al-Muta effectively translates into English as temporary marriage, okay? Uh, Zawaj al-Muta is an agreement, a marriage agreement between two adults who decide to make a marriage contract, either oral or written. Uh, 
for a fixed marriage period time period of time it can last many years so for example it can last two years it can last three years it can last five years it can last a month two months three months uh it can last as long as the the two parties wish so all of the conditions of this marriage including the agreed upon dowry is discussed with the female having full rights to lay down her conditions as she pleases this practice is, in, is done in order to protect the society from children being born out of woodlock when the means of marriage is scarce. This, however, is not a requirement for temporary marriage to take place. <clears throat> so uh, when the marriage is concluded, the ex-wife must wait for a number of monthly cycles in order to ensure that there are, is no children born from the marriage. This effectively eliminates Ill illegitimate children being born in its entirety. So the society is protected from uh, illegitimate children. Now, why is that important? That's important because when you have a society where you don't know whose father is who, you don't know whose son is who, you don't know who has responsibility to take care of this child, the society breaks down. This is the core foundation of society is family. The father raising the children, the mother raising the children. If you have kids who aren't being raised properly, that translates into a, a weak society. So that's that's basically the whole point of marriage. Really, is to protect society. It's an it's a nuclear economic function as well, right? So, in order for us to assess whether or not zawaj al muta or temporary marriage is moral or immoral, we have to compare it to an accepted moral standard, which is temp which is permanent marriage. This standard is accepted and agreed upon by both Sunnis and Shia parties and even non-Muslim parties. This is done in order for us to see if muta marriage fulfills all the sufficient reasons as to why permanent marriage makes sexual intercourse moral. Thus, the accepted criteria for something for a marriage being moral or immoral is permanent marriage so we take all the facets of permanent marriage what does permanent marriage do why is permanent marriage a good thing why is it when we have you know uh feelings such as love emotional and physical enjoyment acting upon our created nature uh having closest to the uh, to another person of the opposite sex all of these are benefits of marriage but these aren't the reason why marriage is moral Rather, what makes these actions moral is that they are done within the scope of marriage. That is, marriage was created to facilitate these actions of love and affection within a legal and moral framework. That's why marriage is considered moral, because all the actions of sex, of love, of having children, are done within a scope of morality. It, it acts as a function to protect the society. So if we if we look at muta marriage and we we think to ourselves, well, does muta marriage that is temporary marriage does muta does temporary marriage fulfill all the functions of permanent marriage? If it does, then how can you claim that muta marriage is immoral when it does the same exact thing as permanent marriage? So that's our criteria of. You know, that's our standard of how can we define a moral marriage. So what are the functions of marriage that allow marriage to moralize the actions mentioned above? Why are these actions, when done within the scope of marriage, are not only seen as permissible but praiseworthy? Okay, so this standard is defined by listing out the reasons. So what are the reasons for marriage? Why does marriage exist? What's the point? So there are three main sections that marriage deals with. Number one is to protect the rights of the children. Number two is to protect the rights of both parties involved, that is the wife and the, the husband. <clears throat> and number three, it is because it is an action that is based upon revelation. So this doesn't just mean Islam. This means any any religion which believes in, in an infinite God, in a God who is omnipotent, omniscient. If you believe that, a, that this God is revealing something to you, it is by definition moral because a perfect, God, a God who is, is perfect, a God who is omniscient, a God who is omnipotent, a God who is doesn't have any imperfection, will not reveal something to you which is immoral. So that's another point that is important to mention. So let us begin with the rights of the children born in a temporary marriage. All the rights that children receive within permanent marriage are received in temporary marriage. The lineage of the child is preserved. His purity is preserved. 
The upbringing and discipline of the child is mandatory. This is all in temporary marriage. Financial support is obligatory upon the father during and after the marriage for the child. The child inherits wealth from the father, the same as in, the same as in permanent marriage. So all the rights that the child receives from permanent marriage are exactly are the same exact in temporary marriage. Temporary marriage also has a waiting period where the ex-wife must be sure that she is not pregnant before getting married again. By waiting for a series of monthly cycles, exactly like in permanent marriage, with permanent marriage waiting period being longer, thus lineage is protected exactly like it is in permanent marriage. What, what do I mean by all that? So let's say you get married to a wife, or you get married to a woman, okay? She's your wife now. Let's say you divorce her, okay? You go through the procedure of divorcing her. You have to make sure that she is not pregnant before she gets married again. That's upon her. It's obligatory for her to do that. This is in both permanent and temporary marriage. So how does she do that? Like I said, she waits for a, uh, a month of monthly cycles, two or three, and she makes sure she's not pregnant, then she gets married again. This protects the lineage of the child. This protects, uh, you know, the child from being raised by another man. It protects the child from being you know their father is unknown who's gonna raise this boy well guess what you went into a contract right you agreed you have full religious obligation and economic and legal obligation to raise this child that came out of that came out of this relationship so like i said all the rights and all the benefits and all the functions that permanent marriage offers is the same exact thing in temporary marriage so point number one the rights of the children, that's also protected by temporary marriage. So number two, uh, the rights of the wife. <clears throat> the rights of the wife in a permanent marriage are exactly the same as temporary marriage, except for a few distinctions. The distinctions are the wife in a temporary marriage does not inherit from a deceased husband. And unless the female makes it mandatory, the husband is not obliged to offer food and shelter to the wife during the marriage. However, this is this only means that the wife has a choice of accepting fin financial help or not. If the temporary wife wishes to receive food and shelter or anything else, even $20 million, for example, if she so pleases to ask, it then becomes obligatory on the man to hand it over before temporary marriage. So let's say you want to make temporary marriage with a woman. Okay, you list out your conditions. Her conditions are: you have to take care of me. You have to you have to take care of any children that comes out. You have to offer me this. You have to offer me that. If she lists that as a condition, you have to fulfill it before you even lay a finger on her. So obviously, financial support is within the hands of the female. Whatever she asks for, whatever she asks for, even if she asks that you don't touch her. My condition of this marriage is that I want to. I want this marriage to be like a Western engagement, for example. I I want to be married to you. I want to hold your hand. I want to kiss you. I want to hug you, within a within a temporary marriage. But I don't want any sex involved. I want this to be treated as a contract that if anything does happen, if anything. If we do have sex and there is a child involved, you are obliged to take care of the child and you are obliged to take care of me. That's the whole point of marriage. So we can see that uh, the wife receives full financial support in all cases. Okay, so that's point number two. Finan the, the rights of the, the female, 100%, whatever she asks for, right? So obviously her rights are uh, protected by having a contract number three the revelation of this uh, marriage <clears throat> is is temporary marriage revealed within islamic law this point is irrelevant to our discussion and has no bearing upon the debate for which we are currently in this is due to the fact that our opponent's primary contention is not whether or not muta is revealed or abrogated, but rather our opponent's main contention is that they find temporary marriage to be intrinsically, in and of itself, immoral. According to Sunnis, the Prophet allowed temporary marriage for three days. 
If muta marriage is intrinsically, in and of itself, fornication, and nothing more than prostitution, as the Sunni opposition claims, then they are logically forced to hold the position that the Prophet of Islam allowed prostitution and fornication for three days. So you're telling me, oh, muta equals prostitution. Then you tell me after that, well, the Prophet of Islam allowed it for three days. So are you telling me that the Prophet of Islam allowed prostitution for three days? Number two, this is also refuted by the Quran. It says, وَإِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً قَالُوا وَجَدْنَا عَلَيْهَا أَبَاءَنَا وَاللَّهُ أَمَرْنَا بِهَا And when they do immoral actions, الْفَاحِشَةً They say, we have found our fathers doing the same thing. And Allah has ordered us to do it. قُلْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَأْمَرُ بِالْفَحْشَةً أَتَقُولُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ what, what, what does it say? The Quran says, say to them, O Muhammad, Allah does not order the immoral. Allah does not order you to do what is immoral. So according to Sunnis, Allah ordered the Prophet to reveal muta marriage. So if muta marriage is something immoral and evil intrinsically, then Allah ordered something to that Allah ordered something that was immoral for three days. And this is against the Qur'an. This demonstrates another facet of this discussion, which is the true debate should not be if muta marriage is intrinsically moral, immoral, or immoral, but rather, has muta marriage been revealed? Is this within our religion? Right? So any discussion on the morality of muta, temporary marriage, must take place within the confines of authority of the authority of the Islamic texts. If indeed muta marriage is abrogated, then you have a claim. If muta marriage is never, if muta marriage is no longer allowed, then you can say we're doing zina, fornication. However, we as Shia Muslims give no value to Sunni narrations. We don't care what your books say. We don't take. We do not. Nor do we take their arbitrary and flawed approach approach to authentication of narrations into consideration. We as Shias take our reports, our narrations, our understanding of the Quran, our understanding of the Sunnah, our understanding of Islam and religion in the world, the, the world entirety, from Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from his religion and from the Imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. This is where we take our religion from. So for you to come and tell me, well, the muta marriage, eh, it, it's not an ugly thing, but we just don't believe it's allowed anymore. That is your opinion. So the discussion, the debate should not be whether or not muta is immoral or, or immoral. The Quran already answered that question for you. The Quran already said, Allah does not order the immoral action. Rather, your discussion should be, is whose books are right who has the true source of information that's where this discussion should be not what these people they brought a, a you know i'm not going to get into it they're, they're, they brought a, a girl online or whatever and they're they they're trying to say that uh, this poor girl she this happened to her and this happened to her look look how ugly and evil muta is yeah yeah masakin this quran came down with it the quran clarified the Quran clarified that Allah does not order the ugly, the, the evil, the fornication. Allah has nothing to do with it. So for you to bring a girl online and to, to do that, you're only attacking God's religion, not, not our religion. Sorry, you're only attacking God's religion. And you're only attacking our religion. And you're, and you're only making it look as if you guys uh, don't care about what the Quran says. You only want to make a uh, a show so with that I'm going to conclude uh, I thank the Bayat al Ghadir team for allowing me to come on a, uh, as a guest speaker on their channel and I thank uh, Kalam for hosting me on the channel uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Mike is free um, thank you thank, thank you, you. Uh, go ahead man go ahead take over man this is, okay. this is the Bayat al Ghadir takeover show come on uh, family, right? Just before Bed Al Ghadir, uh, Ghadir truly takes over, right? I'm asking you guys, right? Do me this quick favor. Make sure you hit up the like button. Show your love and show your support. 
and all of that great stuff right there, right? Because we're going to get into some real, like, we're going to get real intricate. We're going to get real intimate as well. And we're going to be discussing a lot of things, okay? So please hit up the like button, share this with your friends, share this with your family members, right? Because I want to make sure tomorrow we're going to have a debate and discussion uh, section where we're going to continue this conversation and we're going to continue it even over into the secular uh, world of doing things, okay? Secular world of doing things, how we should actually have relationships, even if we're non-religious uh, people, should we take on certain practices as to protect the females um, and even the men themselves and the children? That's the most important thing is the children because that's going to really have a knock-on effect to society as a whole. So we're going to be discussing temporary marriages um, as well and see if there's certain things that we can incorporate if we're non-Muslims or if we're Christians into our way of doing things, all right? We, we, we should really aspire to learn from every single person we come in contact with. Take, we should have these, these takeaways, right? If we're listening to people, we're learning from them, like we should best be thinking how, ooh, that's, that's a good idea actually. That's a very good idea. Like as a woman, that's very empowering that I can set forth certain conditions that a man has to fulfill um, for us to take this relationship any further. I, I, I personally find that as a powerful take takeaway. I don't know about you guys. Y'all got to let me know in the comment section. And those of you guys who've been um, donating, love you guys, right? I believe that's my brother Ultra Funky Kiki and all that good stuff. I will be, all right? I will be um, reading out questions and reading out Super Chats later on after the show. Uh, but right now, I just want to give the brothers the opportunity to present the information without any interruptions. All right. So, family, uh, Beta Al Qadir, take over, baby. Let's do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Callum, uh, for allowing us uh, to do this show today. Uh, my name is Sayyid Hassan Bukhari, and I will be talking about the next, next aspect. Obviously, Brother Shadi gave us uh, an overview in terms of the, and more like a um, it was a, a more general perspective of uh, why the legitimacy of this practice. Um, I'm just going to talk about um, the textual arguments. Uh, one thing I want to make clear that there is a different sort of opinion between ourselves and um, our opponents, uh, those that criticise us on the issue of temporary marriage. Our position is that um, it remains valid up until this day. Uh, the majority of Al-Sunnah this day and age, they say it has been abrogated and is no more. Um, there are narrations which, which would, they would point to and which we can rebut. Because we are essentially going on this channel, which is more, uh, it is in an Islamic channel, um, what we thought is I would give you an overview of the, some of the texts and a quick reply. Obviously, if it was if we were going to go into detail, we could have a very, very detailed discussion on the narrations and how they are weak and how we can prove legitimacy. But just in terms of a background, Surah Al-Nisa, which is the uh, fourth uh, chapter of the Quran, um, and the 24th verse um, of that chapter, um, if you look at the commentaries of it, um uh, Qurtabi in his tafsir. Um I'm hoping, hold on, bear no, me a second. Just give me a second on what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna try to bring up the, the document. Um, yeah. So the viewers can inshallah have a look at themselves. Just bear with me a second. Because I think what well, while say that he's doing that, uh say that he tell me when you've got the the text ready. Um uh, I'd like to tell brothers and sisters who are listening um that uh, they're even if there is a difference of opinion, okay, over this, it needs to be understood there was a considerable body of opinion amongst those which, which would be deemed very respected figures in the al Sunnah al Jamaat sect. It should be. Uh, really like, yeah, from amongst, oh, just in terms of who did believe in the legitimacy of Muta, and that's from the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. So, uh, and uh, we will discuss later um, um, who else you know deemed it legitimate but it needs to be understood that there was a body of opinion amongst companions that deemed it legitimate and in, in importantly the people of Makkah and uh, they the, the 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 ulama of that region they also believed in its legitimacy so that's something that you need to bear into mind now um say that you have the text ready i i do um i'm just trying to uh screen share it so everybody can have a look at it just give me a second tell us when you're ready what I'll do is, like so, like I said, there was a body of opinion amongst companions. 
the successors of the companions, they're called the Tabayin, and the ulama of the time, they'd even given rulings on its permissibility. So uh, it isn't a clear-cut matter. So this is what we need to understand. Uh, um, uh, in this day and age, not, a lot of the prop propaganda is, oh, well, there's an absolute consensus that Mota is banned. It was, an, it was stopped at some point. If that was the case, there wouldn't be the difference even amongst the Sahab at the time uh, over its legitimacy, uh, which is what we will seek to prove, inshallah, now. Very briefly, like I said, if we wanted to discuss it, we'd, we'd probably need just an entire show just to prove our point. But just to give uh, brothers and sisters who are listening uh, an understanding, a background, um, I thought it'd be useful to just go through and quickly touch on those durations. So, yeah. Ali, are you ready? Hassan, I think what I'll do is I will probably uh, read the traditions. Um, yeah. And then uh, the viewers can uh, have a look at it. Because for some reason, when you speak, uh, it doesn't allow me to... Um, uh, share the document for the screen. So, so what I, should we do? Do you just want me to read the tradition? And what do you want me to do? Just read it. Uh, yeah, you could uh, you could read it from your side if you like. Or I can actually. It's better if I read it. So, um, this is okay. uh, as, the, as the verse the Sayyid mentioned earlier, verse four twenty four, um, and this is from the famous uh, commentary of the Holy Quran, the uh, al Qurtubi, uh, and the author is Al Qurtubi, who mentions that the majority of the scholars. The majority here, yeah, this is very important. The majority of the scholars, and when he means the scholars, he means the commentators of the Quran, the general ulama, the jurists, etc., etc., state that the meaning of, the, uh, of that verse, meaning verse 424, is that muta marriage, temporary marriage, which was in the beginning of Islam, which was in the beginning of Islam. Then he mentions some Sahaba. So he says, Ibn Abbas, uh, Obey, meaning Obey ibn Qab, famous. Uh, uh, Quran reciter uh, and Ibn Jubair recited this particular verse 424 in a manner as follows so whoever of these women you enjoy the privilege of marriage for a determined period of time then bring them their reward as an ordinance uh, and then it continues to say the Prophet may peace and blessings be upon him and his family then however prohibited it so as you can see there is no doubt that the revelation of verse 424, as confirmed by the majority of the scholars, was that this verse was revealed about temporary marriage and it was an opinion held by a certain group of Sahaba. However, later it was abrogated. Um, but we will deal with the abrogation side of things, inshallah, once um, Sayyid Hassan continues. Can you hear me now? Yeah, okay, so should I just, obviously we'll be going through the text itself, so um, what should we do? Do you actually have the screenshot? Are you going to produce the screenshot? The actual um, scan? Yeah, what you, what you could do, if, if you want to um, uh, carry on, inshallah, with the, with the, with the passages and then okay. for the viewers. Fine, okay, fine, fine. So obviously, so uh, what Sayyid Ali just produced was, the reference was from Tasir Qurtubi, volume 6, page number 215. Um, I'll just touch on the fact that Ibn Hajar, uh, a major, major um, scholar of um, Hadith from al Sunnah al Jamaah, he wrote a commentary of the very famous Sahih al Bukhari called Fat al Bari, Shar Sahih al Bukhari. Um, now, in volume 11, page 427, he wrote as follows Ibn Batal said, the people of Makkah and Yemen have narrated from Ibn Abbas that Muta is permissible. And it is narrated by weak chains that Ibn Abbas revoked its permissibility. The permission of Muta, Muta through him is more authentic and it is also the doctrine of the Shia. Um, something I want to point out. Sorry, sir, fact is, can I just allow the viewers to um, yep. just very quickly have a look at that for themselves. So they can okay. always just go back and, uh, you know, refer. And by the way, by all means, if you don't believe any of these references that we're presenting, feel free to do some research on these scholars and see what type of position they held within uh, Sunnism. And these books are available uh, from the bookshop. So if you don't believe what's being presented to you today, then by all means, go out there, purchase the books yourself and, you know, verify it. You know, and with the, the scans are there. We can always give them to Brother Callum anyway. So if yeah. anybody wants to see them separately, not a problem at all. It's not like we've con concocted in any way or shape or form. 
Um, just a, a very important point. Um, the fact of the matter is it is very well known. Ibn Abbas was the um, cousin of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. Um, a very respected uh, companion. And he had a position, uh, it is recorded in Sayyid Bukhari, on the legitimacy of Muta. Um, what it is, there have been efforts by our detractors to argue that uh, Ibn Abbas, his viewpoint on the topic of Muta changed later. Um, and um, he retracted his stance and said that uh, it is impermissible. Fact of the matter is there is no such authentic narration to suggest he ever ruled against it. In fact, uh, there are traditions in Sahih Muslim that when it was the caliphate, there was a brief period when Yazid was, was, was removed as caliph. So that's some 57 years after the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. And during that time, um, Ibn Zubair became a khalifa for a very for brief period. And during that time, Ibn Zubair um, basically admonished Ibn, Zub, uh, Ibn Abbas for his position on Munta. And Ibn Abbas refuted him. So, and that was at a period when Ibn Abbas had lost his eyesight and Ibn Zabar mocked him, saying that God has made people blind physically you know, and figuratively. And uh, even at that stage in his life, when he'd lost his eyesight, he was still ruling on the legitimacy of Muta. Um, one of the arguments that is presented is, oh, Ibn Abbas, he did say that it's, it's, it could be utilized in a time of emergency. Brothers and sisters, Please take a point into you in here. Consider this point. He said in an emergency. Now, ultimately, that's purely subjective. Emergency can arise whenever an individual deems something an emergency. And I'm sure, inshallah, ta'ala, when Brother Ryan will touch on this topic later, um, he will try to sort of argue that point. But um, I've just quoted Ibn Hajjah. So basically, Ibn Abbas viewed it permissible, and at no, no point did he rule against it. If there are narrations which suggest he did, those narrations are weak as per the comment of Ibn Hajar. Now, as for Al-Albani, Al who's very, very revered amongst the uh, Salafi sect, um, he summarized those statements of Ibn Abbas, and he said that um, this is from Irwa uh, al-Ghalil fi Takhrij, a hadith, Mar al-Sabil, volume 6, page 319. Uh, Three I, statements. I'll bring it up uh, quickly again um, Okay. Uh, for the viewers to have a look at. Um, okay. That's the that's the the passage which uh, Sayyid Hassan mentioned. Yeah. Uh, and that's the, the Fatul Bari one, yeah. No, uh, the Fatul Bari one which I I, I previously uh, present, presented. This is for um, the statement regarding Al, um, Ibn Abbas retracting his statement because obviously yeah. Ibn Hajar confirmed that he never retracted his statement. So absolutely, this is, absolutely. This is um, uh, the famous Salafi scholar scholar Albani and what he mentions about uh, Ibn Abbas's view. Do you want to read it, Zaid, quickly? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. The first one is, it is absolutely lawful. The second one is, his lawfulness is in an emergency. And the last, it is absolutely prohibited. And this is not proven, unlike the first two statements, which are proven to have been stated by him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So the real strength in position is uh, its lawfulness and its uh, lawfulness in an emergency. So, any narrations which our opponents may produce that has been prohibited in the, opi in the opinion of um, Ibn Hajar and um, Albani, that stance is from narrations that are weak. Now I'm going to quote um, Badr al Aini, who also wrote, um, he was a Hanfi scholar, and this is his commentary of Sahih Bukhari, volume 17, page 329. And Abu Umar has mentioned the old discrepancy about it. He says, as for the companions, they differed about Nikah of Muta. Ibn Abbas opined its permissibility and lawfulness, which is there is no dispute about that opinion from him. And that is the opinion of most of his companions. Amongst them, Atta bin Ibn Abi Rabah, Sayyid Ibn Jubair and Dawus. He said its permissibility and lawfulness has been narrated also from Abu Sayyid al-Khudri, Jabir ibn Abdullah, and both said, we contracted temporary marriage up until the first half of Umar's caliphate, until he forbade it, forbade it for the people in the case of Umar bin Huraith. So basically, we've got companions acknowledging that Muta was practiced up until midway into the caliphate of Umar. And we also have in this narration that... Ibn Abbas deemed it legitimate 
as did his students, Atta, Sayyid ibn Jubair and Dawus, who are narrators in um, the uh, six canonical works of al Sunnah wal Jabbar and in Muwatta Imam Malik. They are very, very respected um, narrators of hadith. Next narration, Sayyid Ali, Tafsir Qurtabi. Yeah? yeah go you got ahead. it ready? So, from Tafsir Qurtabi, volume 6, page 222. Abu Bakr al-Tartusi uh, said, no one allowed Muta marriage except Imran bin Hussein and Ibn Abbas and some of the Sahaba and a group of Adul Bayt. Now, so there was a body of opinion amongst companions and amongst the Adul Bayt. And obviously, as followers of the Adul Bayt, this is why we have that position. Now, from Tafsir al-Salabi, I say, and Nikah Muta has not been permitted except by Imran ibn al Hussein and Abdullah ibn Abbas and some of his companions and a group of Alul Bayt. And this is from Kashful Bayan, volume 3, page 287. So again, there is a position from amongst some companions and the Alul Bayt on the legitimacy of Muta. Um, I think there's one point that I wanted to point out. There are narrations um, which are in the books of Alul Sunnah wal Jama'ah of uh, that uh, Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib um, ruled on the impermissibility of Muta and so he's uh, um, stating that it had been uh, deemed prohibited at uh, Haibar. Um, it's interesting. Those narrations, um, whilst they exist in Shia and Sunni sources, the Shia narrations are not authentic uh, because there are weaknesses in the chain. And the Sunni narrations is can be conf they also have weaknesses because um, the narrations in those narrations, Imam Ali alayhi salam. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, please. Imam Ali alayhi salam is actually admonishing Ibn Abbas, saying, "Why do you deem uh, Allah, Why do you deem it um, permissible when the Prophet said it's not?" Now the question is, if that's true. Why did Ibn Abbas still deem this permissible? Did he not believe in the testimony of Ali, alayhi salam, or did he not believe in what the Prophet said at Khaybar? So that's just a point that you know I want to get in people's minds that if people do say that Ali ibn Abi Talib said this, that position is actually contradicted by the stance of Ibn Abbas. Um, so um, obviously we also have companions and scholars who advocated on Muta. Um, so I think I've um, did, I just mentioned yeah, Tafsir Qurtabi, didn't I? Just on a side note, if you yeah. look at the traditions regarding the prohibition, yeah. it mentions that on the day of Khaybar it was uh, forbidden, right? Yeah. Uh, mm. Yeah, when we look at history, uh, we see that it was actually practiced up until the farewell Hajj of the Holy Prophet. Correct. So it's, you know, to suggest that it was prohibited, it could well be, it may have been prohibited just for that day, because under the situation at that particular moment in time, the Muslims were at war for a, a long period. And as you know, in this day and age, um, you know, in order to uh, keep the motivation of uh, fighters or soldiers, I mean, even nowadays, you see in boxing, for example, some fighters, they would not actually sleep with their partners for weeks before a fight. So there could have been a, a theory that for that particular day, there was some type of prohibition. But if we were to accept it generally, that it was a prohibition up till the Day of Judgment, then it's problematic because we see that you know despite the so-called prohibition it was something which was practiced till the time of umar uh, until umar uh, you know he stopped uh, i believe amr ibn Hurayth from uh, 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 practicing it there's also some weird objections to this i've heard the, the fact that you know it eventually became forbidden during the time of umar meaning that it was always forbidden from the time of khaybar but people were practicing it up till the time of Umar, um, which again is problematic because then, you know, we could say, well, it was what, it's what Sahaba were going around sleeping with people and nobody did anything about it. Nobody was liable to punishment. And even after the Khilafat of Umar, we see Sahaba practicing it, such as the case of uh, Mawiya and so forth. The issue is here is that because this is such a big topic, you know, we could provide endless commentaries um, and endless evidences about Sahaba, about Ahl al-Bayt, um, you know, believing in its legitimacy. But unfortunately, due to the time constraint, we have to try to cover as much as possible um, for this issue. I say, I think that you had one more thing left to read, wasn't it? 
That's right. I, I think I was going to quote um, Tafsir Salabi. And sure. uh, there's actually two or three more ne- references. I'll just go through them quickly, actually. Tafsir Salabi said, I say, and Nikah Muta has not been permitted except by Imran ibn al Hussein and Abdullah ibn Abbas and some of his companions and a group of Al Bayt. So that's from Kashul Bayan, volume three, page 287. Um, I'll just give the next, I'll rush through the next duration. Qazi Abiyala on Nikah Muta. He says in uh, Al Mushahil Al Fakim in Kitab Al Raithin, Wa um, Wajan, Wajan, Volume Two, Page One Hundred and Seven. Saleh and Abdullah and and Hanbul have narrated that Nikah Muta is haram, but Ibn Mansur has said that he asked him, and if that means asked Ibn Hanbul, and he's one of the Imams of Fiqh of Al Sulaim Al Jama, he asked him about Muta of women. Do you say it's haram? He said to avoid it uh, is dearer to me. This shows that it is makru that, and not haram. Now, in terms of, I'll just, uh, viewers need to understand, makru does not make, so, makru is something that c- should be avoided, but it isn't, hal- it's not haram. Okay, so it's something that can be done, but it isn't har- haram as per se. And um, this is an important point because it, um, then what, even even Humble has got narrations on, the, uh, on muta being prohibited. But look at his viewpoint. He's saying it's not haram, it's something that just shouldn't be done. Then we've got uh, Burhan uh, in uh, Al Hadaya, Shar Badayat al Mubtadi, volume 3, page 28. He said that Imam Malik said it is lawful because it was mubah, permissible. So it remains such until abrogation appears. Again, viewers, um, I'd like to stress a point um, that uh, Imam Malik is one of the four Imams of Sunni uh, fiqh. Uh, which is uh, present today, he had narrations in his Muwatta on the prohibition of, of uh, Nikah Muta. Despite that, he still said that it's permissible, it's Mubah, and it remains as such as it hasn't been abrogated. So it, despite him having these narrations, he didn't rule on it being impermissible. So I just wanted to touch on the fact that, yes, Whilst there might be narrations that Muta has been prohibited, the fact of the matter is it conflicts with other narrations which say it is permissible. And there were Sahaba, prominent Sahaba like Ibn Abbas believed in it, and the Adul Bayt, alayhi salatu wasalam, whom we follow, they believed in its legitimacy too. So over to the next in, next of the team. Brother Daniel, do you want to go ahead, brother, before uh, Brother Ryan comes in? Yeah, let's do it. Assalamu alaikum. So, um, I think the part that I will talk about is on your screen, Said Ali. If you um, would be able to share that, that would be great. So, no, um, no problem. No quick, problem. For the views, my name is Daniel. I'm a, a convert to Shia Islam. I was a Sunni before. I come from a Christian background. And. No, um, well, this makes it possible for me to see both sides of the metal. And um, yeah, what I can add that, um, of course, in the Sunni tradition, it's very common to shame the Shias for the Muta and the misconceptions they have about it. And maybe just one thing I wanted to add to the discussion because it's a funny coincidence. I just had a talk to my wife today, and a Sunni friend of her told her that. Um, as it is very common, unfortunately, that um, there was one brother who is very, very well known to marry sisters for a month and then divorce them and then divorce them. And um, that sister told her that um, her friend who was married to that guy, that uh, she was pregnant. And that guy said, OK, I will divorce you until Ramadan is over. And it was Ramadan. So <laughs> um, and this is um, unfortunately very common. So I've witnessed this um, many times. And um, it's a very common practice among Sunnis, actually, um, to um, get into marriages while already having the intention to divorce them. It's uh, especially among uh, young young Muslims who are maybe new to practicing the faith and um, <clears throat> not too uh, too much morally grounded. They will, will try to live a little religious life, but um, then they still have their temptations. And it's pretty common among the Sunnis too that um, they would get into marriages that would be divorced like a week or a month and then would jump into the next one and jump from one marriage to another. And it's not 
uh, not absolutely not true that um, the the Shia well, it ha it happens in the Shia community too. Obviously, like every everything in religion can be abused, but it's uh, very silly to accuse only the Shias of uh, abusing um, the the rights of marriage given to us. So the thing, uh, that's just uh, a little thing I wanted to mention before I get to the topic I want to speak on, which would be um, actually uh, how the concept of misyar nikah and the concept of uh, of the of the, um, <coughs> sorry, the evidence of what <coughs> so the misyar nikah, which is a uh, um, kind of temporary marriages, like um, this means that. Somebody would uh, get into a traveler's marriage, so he would live in a foreign country for a while, and then he would not have his permanent wife with him, and so he would engage in a marriage there, um, and the wife would um, give up her rights that she would usually have. That would mean that she would have to be sustained, that she would be, have to be given a housing, a living, that would be the Nemesiar Nikah. And there is another type which is um, called, uh, I actually forgot the Arabic term, but I think we'll see it on the document that will be shared. Um, that is the marriage with the intention to divorce. And there is, I admit there is some uh, disagreement with the Sunni scholars with that, um, but a lot of uh, very renowned scholars allow this type and for the men, not for the women, but they will say, okay, if a man enters a, uh, nikah, uh, a marriage, and he will already have the intention in his heart to divorce that woman after a month or something, then this would still be a valid marriage, okay? So, um, um, we already see that um, it is, some people try to um, develop concepts that would have the benefits that uh, Muta can have one of the some of the benefits that Muta can have and try to reintroduce it to religion because it's obvious that there are uh, some benefits. Yeah? Um, Said Ali, do you have the document available? Yes, it's uh, everyone can see it. Oh, it's already there. Okay, I didn't see it. <laughs> Great. So yeah, this is uh, from the uh, from a ministry in Kuwait, the religious ministry, and it um, is about exactly that topic that I mentioned, the marriage with the intention of divorce. So um, I will probably not read the whole stuff, but um, basically what it is saying is um, that the, for Mathahib, the schools of thought in the Sunni school, um, have some disagreement upon it. But the majority of, uh, opinion is that it is valid to do that kind of marriage. So you can enter a marriage with the intention of divorce, and it's the Hanbalis, um, who would more disagree on it. So they have a scholar, al Awzai, and he believed it to be unlawful, and uh, that's where they disagree. And they have some other scholars. But the Shafi'i say it's makru, so it's um, disliked, but it's not forbidden. And um, so what they basically have is a concept of marriage that is practically the same as muta. So you can enter a marriage, and the document says, officially, official Kuwaiti uh, document says, someone marries a woman with the intention of divorcing her after one month or more or less. The marriage is lawful, whether the woman or his wali know the intention or not. That is because the marriage contract is free of any condition that can make it invalid, so it would not be invalid because of the intention, because a man may intend to something, but then he does not do it, etc., etc. So... Um, I think that is uh, the Arabic version of this. What is uh, what Said Ali is showing? Now we have uh, from Sharh Sahih Muslim. This is written by the famous Sunni scholar Nawawi, famous Shafi'i scholar, and he's quoting uh, uh, another scholar, Al Qadi, who said um, that whoever would do such a marriage with the intention of getting divorced. Um, would be legal according to their fiqh and um, the muta marriage which they put in contrast to that concept of marriage um, is illegal but this is because they have pre-rendered conditions they made 
So they say the muta marriage is only which occurs with the previously mentioned conditions. However, Malik said it is not from the manners of the people, but this is more like a moral consideration they have. But they basically say that it's agreed upon that the intention of divorcing a woman when entering the marriage contract is valid. So, uh, uh, sorry, Daniel, just on a quick note, and I think, Reiner, it would be great if you can elaborate further. See, the issue here is that they don't actually disclose a, a period prior to getting married. So where a man would make an intention that, okay, I'm going to get married to this woman, but in a month's time, I'm going to dump her. Yeah. So can you imagine the situation where a couple get, you know, uh, married, you know, there's a huge wedding, members of the community are invited, you know, scholars of the community are invited, heads of the community, and, you know, a month down the line, the, the guy just dumps her. That's it. How embarrassing would that be for the food? Yeah. And there is no way for the woman to prepare herself for that. Like, would, yeah. would, would, would any Sunni sister take on a marriage knowing that her husband could just practically be deceiving her just to sleep with her and dump her like a week later or a month? And that happens. Like it's not like it's not like these things don't happen. And um, the woman in that part has no security for herself. Even in many occasions, uh, and we know how the Islamic societies sometimes work, she will be in a position that she has to take all the blame for that. Yeah. Because, because the husband will say, "Oh, it was her fault. She didn't cook. She didn't do this and that." And yeah. I couldn't. Uh, and no, probably nobody will believe the wife. And in what kind of situation would she be? Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I just make a quick statement? Sure. That's okay. So I'm I'm looking through the chat, and some people are saying, "What about alcohol?" Uh, the Quran. When I we, when we talk about muta marriage or temporary marriage, we're talking about its intrinsic morality. We're not talking about it being revealed or, or not revealed. So if you guys say, for example, the Sunnis will say, well, alcohol was not banned. Well, I have a question for you. Who said that alcohol is not intrinsically bad? The Quran never said, go ahead and drink alcohol. They were already doing it. The Quran came down to, re, to ban it. Quran never says to you, oh, go ahead and drink alcohol. It's okay if you guys do it. No, it doesn't say that. So another question for the Sunnis who say that alcohol was is not intrinsically bad, or this argument translates into the muta argument. That's will the would, would the Prophet drink alcohol? Is that okay for him to drink alcohol? Let's say before the verse came down for banning of alcohol, is it possible for the Prophet to drink it? For the Sunnis who are saying, "Well, what about alcohol? What about alcohol?" Yeah. Bro, I think you're I think you're expecting too much from these guys. To be honest, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if they did say yes. Yeah, well, true. there are there are some Sunni muftis who say, well, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he gave alcohol to his companions. I think it was uh, an Urifi or something. I don't know his name. Yeah. Uh, he 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 was sitting there with his companions, and uh, there was alcohol, and he was passing out alcohol to them. It's on YouTube. Go ahead and look. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you want to make the argument that alcohol wasn't banned later on, it has nothing to do with the discussion. Alcohol was always bad. Even the Quran says, alcohol is from the handiwork of the, sh of the shaitan. Alcohol, that means in and of itself, alcohol is bad. So are you going to tell me that Allah says, go ahead and drink what the shaitan uh, pushes you towards? Or that the Prophet himself, just because it's adverse and it come down to ban it, that the Prophet himself would have, would have drunk alcohol? So it has nothing to do uh, you know abrogation and some people in the chat unfortunately there are many there are many uh, ignorant people in the chat so I want I want to I want to ask you guys a question it's fine Shadi, ask... Shadi, yeah. think if they want to compare to alcohol then the Imam <clears throat> the Sahaba believed in the legitimacy of drinking alcohol till they died simple as that who they a claim of the best of generations to follow. Yeah, they say that they're the best generation to follow, yet they were constantly going to war and killing each other. That's another topic, though. <laughs> so you guys go ahead and continue. I just wanted to yeah, so about, bring Daniel, that point up. Yeah, uh, go ahead, carry on. Please continue, brother Daniel. Daniel, could I add yeah. one point, actually? You mentioned a very good point that um, yeah. often, unfortunately, it's a patriarchal society, and there's a general assumption that it's the woman's fault. So a man, essentially... He gets his wicked way with a woman. He basically weds her. Uh, you know, um, uh, you know, it's a, a lavish wedding. Everybody's attending, just like say that he gave the example. 
he has his way with her and then he dumps her. So essentially, society frowns upon that woman. And another problem I want to stress that particularly I would say amongst, um, uh, I would say amongst the South Asian communities, amongst the Arab communities, a woman that is divorced, it's very, very difficult for her to remarry. So mm. for no fault of her own, she has been, uh, an individual has slept with her because, uh, you know, because there's a, a desire to marry a virgin woman. Now she's no longer a virgin. She's been, someone slept with her. He's dumped her. People will, A, they'll assume it's her. You know, it's her fault. And now she's going to be treated as secondhand goods and nobody will want to marry her again. Yeah. So if, if people, you know, there's an assumption, oh, well, what type of relationships, um, they abuse and um, they take advantage of women. Well, at least with, with Muta, both parties know what, you know, their cards there's are already shown. There's, there's, there's nothing hidden. Yeah. But with this one, a woman is tricked and then dumped. So if individuals are talking about taking a moral high ground, how can you, when you have this type of marriage in your sect? Yep. Yeah, so I was going to say that they do a form of taqiyah. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a form of taqiyah. You are tricking a woman and then dumping her. And I find it amazing that um, our opponents are saying, oh, this is a major problem in the Shia community. But well, what about these sort of problems that you're having then, where well, you well, can well, essentially well, dump a woman off just yeah, uh, marrying her and that's it? Job we'll done. Come, we'll come to major problems in the community right at the end of the show. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, Carry uh, on, Daniel. Daniel, please continue. Well, yeah. um, so, um, there might be a few things to add, but maybe yeah, it's better if you delay it until the end of the discussion. So, let's continue with the document. Here we have Ibn Qudama al Maqtisi. He's a, a famous Hanbali scholar, actually. And um, he says if the man marries her, the wife without openly disclosing any condition of the time limit except that what is in his heart he intends to divorce her after a month or after fulfilling his need in his town then the marriage is valid uh, according to the statement of the generality of the scholars so except even Ozari so we have uh, again the statement that uh, even the majority of the scholars said okay this kind of marriage is permitted so uh, this is, uh, for the obvious reasons we stated, a very difficult type of marriage because the problems will, in most cases, will always remain with the woman and with the wife. So if people accuse Shias of ruining, ruining women's lives, then what damage will this kind of marriage do? And we can elaborate these problems further later. So then we have the Arabic scan here. Then we have Ibn Bas, I think a, a man that needs not much introduction, famous Salafi scholar of our time and ages. And in his Masail Ibn Bas, where is a collection of fatawa, he's asked what is the rule for the marriage with the uh, intention of divorce. So his answer is it's permissible. Muwaffaq said it on behalf of the majority and from Azari it's prohibition. So we only have, mostly we only have Al Azari who is referred to in regards of the prohibition. And the next question is, isn't the marriage with the intention of divorce cheating the woman? No, it's not. Because it, it obviously is, but it's, it's a funny fact. <laughs> 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 like, no, <laughs> no, why? Why should it be? It's all good. Yeah, in Ibn Bas, can mind this might be it good, makes but you, it makes you think where they innovate these practices like where did they get from you know at least well, at least with yeah. Muta, it has some sort of basis where the imams accepted it the sahaba practice it all yeah the, all the alleged statements about them re retracting the statement they were weak but of course at the end you of the day the imams gave fatwas on it saying that it's either disliked or you know it, it is permitted it's mubah but mm, true. You know, where the, where the hell do they get these innovations from? Like they talk about innovations, or innovations mm -hmm. lead to hellfire, and technically, all these people practicing this type of marriage. Yeah, um, and that's it. And we have like that's an, an innovation that clearly goes against moral standards set by Islam, and we clearly have a form of treacherous behavior that would take away the rights and the mm -hmm. the hack of a of a of another believer of the woman. So um, anyone who does that will be responsible for every evil or bad consequences that the wife would suffer from such kind of uh, treatment. Or, well, I mean, if we look at um, 
how much uh, honesty and uh, rel being a reliable husband is emphasized in the Islamic country. It's very hard to come up with such a strange innovation, actually. Mm. And so, so Daniel, we've got we've got this aspect where they make an intention, uh, a marriage with the intention of divorce. Is there another type of marriage which you were mentioning at the start? I think it was more of a, a traveler's type of marriage where they travel and they. True. Yeah. Can you get that? I scratched it before, right? I said uh, that's the that's the Messiar message, like the travel yeah. message, and that's a very similar context. So we have this from uh, Abu Malik Kamal. Um, what's the verdict about the marriage of Messiar? Like Messiar would mean that, um, like, let's explain the text itself. The marriage of Al Messiar is one of the forms of marriage in some countries. On, and the belief of what I understood about the de definition is that the man marries the woman legally and keeps his conditions and principles except that the woman withdraws from some of her rights from the husband by her own consent, like the right of habitation and sustenance and staying over with her and maintaining justice between her and his other wives and so on. And the most significant reason of creation for this kind of marriage and its popularity in some countries are the following. Existence of a large number of women who have reached the age of marriage and spent a long part of their life without marriage. Um, could you just scroll a little down, Said Ali? Sure. Perfect. So women who are in need of a man and um, for the man, he might have been on a travel, might have gotten attracted to a kind of marriage due to his desire for the opposite sex, and so on. So um, what this basically does is give obvious reasons for why people would do that. I mean, it might all be <laughs> possible to sum it up to uh, interhuman attraction between the sexes. But um, what is the verdict about this marriage? Because um, this type of marriage would uh, obviously not give the woman her full rights, but um, still it is considered mubah, permissible with reluctance, and the source of this opinion is that it is a marriage contract which has the conditions and principles of religiously lawful marriage and is not a way of doing haram, <laughs> like like they say muta, they mention it, yeah, but uh, I really wonder for how, why is on which base is there um, the assumption that muta is for the case of haram? Like muta is to avoid haram, and obviously this one has the same intentions. So, what they say um, is the different opinions of the Sunni scholars regarding this, and um, actually the majority again agrees with it. And then we have a type of scholars that disagree with it. And um, the chosen opinion here of the particular scholar is that um, uh, this marriage is correct and the marriage is uh, valid and um, it could be abused, what he says. The condition is false and through this can be conducted religiously and well, uh, what we can say is there are differences of opinion. I think it's um, not too much important to go into the reasons for the various opinions because, um, like, after all, mostly people would follow what they like and not what they deem the most true. So I think that many men in the Sunni world would say, okay, maybe my scholar wouldn't allow it, but I still allow it to myself because it makes sense, right? So we have the Arabic texts for what we stated above. So as we can see, we have as well as on the marriage with the intention of divorce, as well as for the Misyar, the travelers marriage, we have um, very respectable scholars who would allow that and who would see no problem with that. So we have another fatwa from um, Muhammad ibn Ibrahim al-Tawajiri. It's allowed for the man to marry a woman and make a condition upon her he comes to her whenever he wants. She's content with it. He can marry her because of the right of maintaining justice belongs to her, and she's content with it to, to be withdrawn. And this is what's called marriage of misyar in the society. And there's also, actually, after all, not much different 
to Muta, except that there is no certain time limit fixed. But I think both parties would know that as soon as the man who might be, for example, he's a traveling worker, he was originally from India or Pakistan, he would live in Saudi Arabia to work there for for a year or two, and he would do a Messiar uh, marriage there, and he go back to India, like, they obviously would divorce, like, for which reason would they stay married, right? So, um, we have... I think that's brilliant, uh, Brother Daniel. Um, again, as we mentioned at the start of the show, we can uh, bring a plethora of evidence um, showing how the scholars permitted a marriage with intention of divorce, uh, this type of traveler's marriage, which uh, they permitted. Um, but without further ado, I want to go over to Brother Ryan, and inshallah, then what I'll do is I'll wrap up the show. Uh, well, uh, Sayyid Ali, do you want me to mention the other type of nikah as well, yeah, halala? You should, you should mention halala, which is another form. Okay, uh, if I could just mention it. Um, obviously, viewers, um, let me explain to you that in Islam, there is a, a, both sex are in agreement that if we have a scenario where a man and a woman divorce, okay, a relationship ends, and if they ever want to reconcile in the future, the reconciliation can happen, but there is a condition that the woman has to remarry the, 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 somebody else. The, the, because, you know, this is a serious thing. There is no, you can't just be married one day, divorce, and then remarry. The, the, there has to be then a break. It's almost like a punishment that the, it can't continue this way. Now, if that's a position between the two sex, then why are we talking about nikah halala? Let me explain to you why I am. In The Quran talks about um, divorce over three menstrual cycles. So you cannot simply divorce a woman immediately. First, it's the, in Islam, it's the right of the male. And when it comes to divorce itself, you can't simply say, that's it, khalas, the relationship is over, the end. It must span the divorce period over three menstrual cycles. And uh, um, so obviously so to determine issues such as if the woman is pregnant, parentage, all these issues. So the Quran talks about three menstrual cycles. This is something that we need to take into account. Now, the, the uh, Shia Islam, likewise, has uh, the concept of divorce in Shia Islam is the same. Um, if you if you divorce a woman, you can't do it just in anger and, and, and end the relationship. It needs to be done over three menstrual cycles. It needs to be done over that three-month period in the presence of a witness as well. So uh, the, uh, the husband will say, I divorce you one month. And after the, during that time, if they reconcile, um, it, that that first divorce can be revoked and the relationship can continue. So it's kind of over that three month period. If after the three month period, the, the third time the divorce is uttered, the relationship has end, ended. They are no longer married. Now that's so it's quite stringent. The the, the stages in which a husband, a Shia man, and a Shia woman divorce are are, um, are quite strict. It's not something that you can you can't just angrily say that's the end of the relationship. It's thought out. It's um, protracted. It's an opportunity to consider the relationship, to see if this uh, reconciliation can happen. All of those. And then if it doesn't work out after the, that three-month period, the relationship ends. Now, compare this to Sunni Islam. Sunni Islam doesn't have a period of three menstrual cycles. Um, a husband, and unfortunately, we're not talking about this is the sunnah as established by the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. This was actually... Um, uh, an innovation uh, during the time of the second caliph, where essentially you don't have three menstrual cycles in which to sort of um, uh, see if the relationship can be reconciled. A husband in anger can say, that's it, I've had enough, I'm divorcing you. And that's it. If he says it three times, I divorced thee, I divorced thee, I divorced thee, the relationship ends there and, th there, and then. There is no, um, there's no opportunity to reconcile. That's it. And this is where the problem happens, because um, whereas in Shia Islam, we don't have that scenario. In Sunni Islam, essentially, you can divorce a woman quicker than uh, Usain Bolt running 100 meters. And that's a really, really unfortunate scenario that we have. Um, so essentially, a husband is angry, he says it, and that's it. The relationship is over. Now, how now often we have this scenario where the husband thereafter reflects and he regrets what he's done because he was angry. And in this uh, fit of rage, he said, I divorce you three times, but the relationship is ended. Now, how can the situation be uh, remedied? 
the, the only way it can be remedied is through the practice of nikah halala, which essentially means now the woman has to now sleep with another man, have another marriage, and then that man can divorces her, and then she can go back to her husband. So essentially, the uh, the first marriage has happened almost. It's ended um, in a fit of rage. It wasn't intended, but it's happened. She has to sleep with another man to then go back to her husband, and that's called nikah halala. And unfortunately, that's a major problem in Sunni communities because of the ease at which a woman can get divorced. Um, there was a documentary on uh, the BBC, uh, British BBC channels, called uh, Women Who Sleep With Strangers. And in that, it talked about women's experiences where the husband and wife love each other. There's a fit of rage. The husband says, I'm divorcing you. And she essentially then has to have an arrangement with another man who agrees to marry her for money. He sleeps with her. Then he gets rid of her the next day so she can return to her husband. Now, if that isn't um, the exploitation of women, then what is? And, and um, in fact, uh, the Pakistani young newspaper also talked about um, how uh, Sunni clergymen essentially were almost, um, they had centers where women could be dropped off in this scenario. They were agreeing to sleep with these women after the marrying them for bank. money and then dumping them. They were called gangbang centers. Exactly. You understand me? It's really this. Uh, the, uh, honestly, the Jihad uh, Jung newspaper actually talked about it, where uh, Sunni clergymen were actually gifting these women to other men. Um, and they were marrying them, having sexual intercourse with them. The requirement is she must have sex with that person and then getting divorced. So that's Nikah Halala. And, and it was so embarrassing. And the article that appears in the news, BBC, you go onto the BBC website, the women who sleep with strangers. And, and honestly, it destroys women because imagine how dirty and unclean they feel. First of all, their relationship has ended with the man that they love. The man regrets it. They can't get back together until she sleeps with a complete stranger, marries him, sleeps with him, and then returns. And that affects those women. There are examples of women suffering from depression, um, you, you know, um, finding it difficult and, and sexual, to have and, sexual relationship with that husband again, the first and husband. And, and the issue of sexual transmitted diseases as well, which is uh, extremely common problem amongst them. Yeah, but do you see what I'm saying? That, uh, if you're talking about the exploitation of women, Let's talk about, I mean, the, the, the individuals who are taking the moral high ground saying, oh, look, Muta humiliates women. Well, tell us about this, how easily you could divorce a woman uh, in, a, in a Sunni nikah. Three times, it's all over. She then has to sleep with another man in a marriage relationship. He has to sleep with her, and then she returns. So women are essentially being treated like baggage. Yeah. Isn't the, that exploitation of women? They're deceived into marriage. Yeah. They, they they used doing traveling purposes when you can visit them and sleep with them. Yeah. Um, and then essentially when it comes to divorcing them, you can have them bed other men before you get back to them. Disgusting. Absolutely. So th I just wanted to give that example. Uh, 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 Ryan, Ryan, over to you, brother. Ryan, quickly. Inshallah, Ryan. Do you want to go ahead, bro? In the name of God, the most merciful, the uh, beneficent, um, peace and blessings and uh, God's mercy be upon you all. Um, so finally, I get to speak. I love the boys for all the things that they've said. I think it's great input. Um, thank you to Callum um, for having us on the channel and thank you to everyone that's been watching us so far. So I'm going to be trying to explain Muta'a um, more so from a secular perspective. I'm also going to talk about my own personal experiences with it because one thing that the uh, Muslim community in the Shia community that predominantly practice it, uh, have is that they don't tend to talk about it. And there's reasons why they don't, but there's also reasons why sometimes they should. Um, when I first engaged in uh, Muta'a, ah, it was done with um, the permission of the father, which is a, a requirement of uh, the fiqh of the marja that he followed, the, how can I say the marja, the scholar in which uh, he and his family imitated. Um, there was also a stipulation put in the contract that there was going to be no uh, sexual contact or anything like that uh, during the period of time. So the fact that we've already touched on this before, the, the fact that a woman can stipulate that there is no sex during the time of the contract um, shows that this isn't just for prostitution. The whole concept of muta has been sadly uh, 
been perversed by a lot of people. It can be used for sex, not going to deny that. But at the same time, that's not the primary function. The primary function is to become mahram for someone during a given period of time. And that can have so many more benefits than what people tend to think. Um, there might be an instance where a woman um, may need to go somewhere. She needs someone to accompany her, um, but she has to do it in a manner in which is halal. So you have to remember too that in Islamic thought that anywhere that a, a non-mahram man and a non-mahram um, woman, they uh, come together, shaitan is the third party present. In the concept of muta'a, because the, the uh, relationship is now halal, shaitan is no longer present. Okay? So when it comes down to, you know, why do we have muta'a and stuff like that, my personal opinion is, one, you can either use it to do what is often talked about. Two, it's to get to know someone better. I use it personally to um, act as a sort of engagement period with my wife before we eventually married, and it was very beneficial. It allowed her to uh, engage in a contract with me where there was restrictions. It allowed for her family to under the eyes of God, know that they had done what they need to do to protect the union between us and make sure that everything was above par. And it's, uh, it's, how can I put this? The, when it comes to, when it comes to whether or not it's a good idea, like Callum said at the very beginning of the show, if, we should apply it um, or apply elements of it in a secular sense uh, today. I think it's kind of been tried but uh, in essence, but it hasn't actually been done. So if you look at the, uh, uh, the result of muta'a, like the boys have already spoken about regarding the, the, the fic relating to the, the children and the, uh, the dowry and et cetera, in modern Western law, we have this concept of child support, right? But we know very well that there's a lot of cases where child support is not necessarily paid and it's very hard to enforce this on the, uh, the man. So with nikah muta'a in Sharia, at least from the view of the Twelvers, um, it's still supported by the, the, the community. It can be judged accordingly and thus protect the rights of the women and the kids and hold the man accountable. So it's something that the West has in essence tried to do with the child uh, support system, but it's, it can't police. And it's something that due to Western law, it's also become hard for Shia to police because they can't enact all of their uh, elements of Sharia, just like Sunnis will often complain they can't enact or act upon all their... Um, judicial rulings and et cetera as well. The act of muta itself is really quite a blessing. It allows the woman to have a lot more control over the situation than what she would usually have in a permanent marriage situation. Um, in permanent marriage, obviously, as the boys have already said, that divorce is the right of the husband, unless there's stipulations put down, because as I've said into the, in the chat, um, when someone asked if there was a, a prenup for temporary marriage, every... Islamic marriage has a contract. That was one of the best things to come about with the, with, the, with the advent of Islam, was that women had a contract so they could put down stipulations for that contract, whether it was a permanent one or a temporary one, and they would receive a, uh, how would you say, a, a dowry or a compensation, and they're also entitled to... Um, benefits with any kids a lot of the things that you'll find in western society are actually based on islamic uh, concepts so the sunni argument as well where they are often seen people say they would rather do zina than do muta which doesn't even make any sense because if muta itself is zina <laughs> then what's the, what's the difference you may as well at least use your 
use your head and at least try to make some sort of consensual agreement between you and your uh, to-be partner where if things were to go haywire, there was uh, protection for you or any children. The, um, I think what's, what's most sad as well is when the, uh, our brothers and sisters over at Ahusuna Wal Jamaat, they don't actually look into the history of uh, Muta'a and they don't look into the benefits of Muta'a. They look at the worst case scenarios that happen when it comes to Muta'a. Like if you look in certain places in the world where Muta'a is abused and et cetera, and the, by God, anyone that abuses the system of Muta'a or any system to oppress women or anything, they are horrible people. There's, there's no doubt about that. No one in this panel would ever uh, condone the uh, poor treatment of anyone at all. And any, any situation in which a man and a woman or any people can come together, regardless of what laws you put in place, you can always be manipulated and abused. You can't, you can't police everything. That's why in Islam, we have, uh, when we're looking at the concept of God, we have to believe that he's adul, you know, that he's, he's just. So anything that doesn't, uh, is, is, is not dealt with in, in this life, it is dealt with in the next life. Um, guys, what else was I supposed to talk about? I can't really remember. <laughs> it's been that long. That's that I was just going to say, you know what, look, if we, let's be frank, right? So they've, they've innovated these other options, right? Um, which was the marriage with the intention of divorce or this traveler's marriage. You know, one involves dissection, whereas mota involves transparency. You know, let's be realistic. If we were to ask most girls, you know, if you were to get into a relationship, you know, for whatever reason, because, it, you know, there's many reasons, in fact, why mota is there. It could be a method where, you know, a, uh, a girl may merely want to get to know someone. Um, because obviously, for us, where we're concerned, you know, a, a male and female shouldn't really be left alone, right? So mm. the option is there in order to prevent any sin taking place because most of these people are raising these objections, they're shouting these slogans, oh, what are like fornication, what are like fornication? You know, these people are probably too busy masturbating or, you know, indulging in um, haram, haram discussions with females. So it's, you can see the inconsistencies there. I, I've, I've recited the, I've recited the muta'a, the, the sigha, a yeah. number of times, and mm. I've never had sex exactly. it at all exactly. with any of the exactly. women because that's not, that's, not, that's not the primary function of exactly. the, the concept. Exactly. It's, it, can be, it can be used for that, but that's not the primary function. Exactly. And so, it, what the problem is that it's not just Sunnis, it's also some Shia as well, who I've heard horrible stories from Shia that it, our opponents haven't even, couldn't even dream of. Where people misuse it, right? Mm. I'm not here to just cover up everything. The horrible things have been done in the name of Muta when it's not even correct. They don't even know how to do it. Yeah. Every problem that ever exists comes down to a lack of education, mm. right? So it's it's really such a shame that the it's people are thinking uh, with their heads in the gutter mm. when it comes to this concept. This concept is actually a very beautiful concept, yeah. and you also have to remember too that. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa he came to the Arabs of his time who were the biggest scumbags on the planet. Like they were the biggest scumbags. They used to bury their own daughters. We live in a, they were living in a perversely patriarchal society. Patriarchy, I'm not saying it's bad, but their version of it was disgusting. You also have to remember too that women were essentially seen as objects. So this whole concept of uh, dowry and stuff like that, if you want to see it, if someone might say to me, well, if it was to help the women get from place to place, why didn't they just you know, have uh, just say, I come with me and stuff like that. Because they, if they were questioned as to what was going on between them, the man would have to prove and the woman would have to prove that they actually were uh, married, at least for that time. So she would have to show that she had some uh, uh, payment for her services. You know what I mean? People tend to forget what those people at that time were like. You know what I mean? Maybe because they've never actually been to Arabia or they've met, <laughs> because there's, some are still like that. But at the end of the day, that's, that's uh, essentially what it is. They've turned a really beautiful thing into a really uh, dirty thing. And mm. it's not, as I said before, it's not just Sunnis that say this. It's because mm. some Shia make, take, make abuse of it. Mm. But at the same time, what the, uh, the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the Ahl al-Bayt, what they taught was not uh, something uh, disgusting. And, uh, yeah. 
I mean, look, okay. the, the bottom line is that type of argument can be applied to even normal marriage, where a man is entitled to taking up to, uh, you know, three additional uh, partners when it comes into the topic of uh, uh, polygamy. Um, yeah, absolutely. So Polygamy does can uh, cause uh, the abuse of women as well, misuse yeah, of women. That's, yeah. Um, can I just give, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Ryan, you've given some really good examples there, but um, one of the problems that we have in society in this day and age, I'm sure all of the, this could resonate with everybody who's listening today, is the problem of relationships breaking down in divorce. And often mm. that's due to the fact that couples don't understand one another. They don't get on. Now, mm. what is the problem? Can you hear me? If uh, I'm not talking about, uh, if a couple enter into a mutar relationship for a certain period of time, just to see if they're compatible with one another, what is the issue there? Mm. Um, that, uh, the, I think one of, the, uh, let me give you an example. In Islam, there is no such thing as an engagement. You know, uh, and one of the community, uh, and I'm, this is not just in Shia Muslims, in Sunni Muslims all, uh, often we have, um, where we have um, couples that they, they get to know each other in university and they get engaged officially through the parents, everyone knows about it, but um, then they go out, they go out cinema, they spend time alone, X, Y, Z, I'm not saying that they fornicate, I'm not in any way suggesting it can happen, but I'm not saying that's the purpose, but the risk is always there because it says that, you know, like Brother Ryan just said, that there's narrations that said when a man and a woman are together, the third person is Satan. Mm. Now, if in those circumstances a father was to say, listen, you two can go out, but you should have this relationship which is Islamic, and as long as the stipulation is you don't have sexual intercourse, like the surah that you've just said, Ryan, with yourself, what's the issue? The couple get to know each other and see if they're compatible. Mm. It's better than getting married and then getting divorced later on. After you've got children, you don't get on. But I, I don't really see what's the problem in getting to know each other through this halal methodology. This is yeah, one point. Can I make yeah, one yeah. statement? Oh, go ahead, Ryan. Sorry, go ahead. It's, it's, a, it's a purely rational and uh, it's consistent with the whole concept of uh, justice and rahmah that we have in, uh, in Islam. Mm. And it, it, it maintains the family unit. It also shows that you know, there needs to be a way for people to... Uh, muta allows for certain things that would be... It, it allows for... It comes in as a necessity, essentially, right? If, if there is a need for someone to have a mahram, if there is a need for someone to get to know someone in close uh, uh, quarters and stuff like that, muta accommodates that. Muta is a temporary thing. It's not supposed to be for... You don't have to do it forever, you know what I mean? If you, you get to know the person and then you can either move on or whatever. You don't ever have to engage in any sexual conduct or anything. And if anyone ever breaks the conditions of the contract, say, say you do, um, do muta with a, a woman and then the condition was that you don't have sex, right? But then what? The man decides that he has sex and then he rapes her. Like that's like that's it's wrong either way. It doesn't make any like I don't understand how there's an argument against this. You know what I mean? And then you look at you know how you know you go on shut it, you say your point. Yeah, so I wanted to just repeat actually, you know, how do we judge whether or not something is moral or immoral? How do we judge whether something or you know something is bad or you know good? Uh natural law goes in line with what God reveals. God never reveals something that is against logic. Now, that is not to say that human logic or human thinking is what dictates what is natural law, but rather human logic can discover what God is, you know, uh, human logic can discover what God wants to reveal, and they can see this matches with what is good and what is bad. So, for if you want to look at Zawaj uh, al Muta, you want to say, well, I, I believe Zawaj al Muta is immoral. I believe Zawaj al Muta is bad. Well, why? Why? What is your evidence? What is your proof? Why, why do you say that it is bad? Well, it's for a temporary period. What do you mean for a temporary period? That in and of itself has no bearing on whether or not a relationship is bad or good. Now, when you want to lie to a girl and say to her, well, yeah, I'm going to be with you for forever, and then you lie to her, then that is bad. But the time period has no bearing whatsoever on whether or not something is moral or immoral. As I said, 
marriage has a function. The function of marriage is not sex, even in permanent marriage. The function of marriage is not sex, it is not emotion, it is not love. The function of marriage is to protect the society when you do have sex, when you do have kids, when you do have emotional relationships. That is the function of marriage. That is why marriage moralizes, I'll repeat, moralizes sex, moralizes emotional uh, connection, moralizes all of these actions which the, the foundation of society is upon. So you, you make a list. What does permanent marriage, which all people agree with, is moral? Christians, Jews, um, you know, uh, Sunnis and Shias, everyone agrees that marriage is, is moral. It is a moral standard. So then why? Ask, this, ask yourselves, why is it a moral standard? Why is it moral? Look at the functions of marriage. What does marriage protect? Marriage protects the children, it protects the wife and the male, and it protects, and, and it's from, it's a revealed thing. If muta fulfills all of these criteria, then why are you saying it's immoral when it is exactly the same, it has the exact same moral function as permanent marriage? Why? Yeah. Where is your evidence for that? To simply say, well, uh, uh, the time period, oh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's just like, no, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> Time period has nothing to do with something being moral or immoral within a marriage situation. Unless you're lying to the girl. Unless you're lying to her and you're telling her, oh, I'm going to be with you for two years. I'm going to be with you forever. The rest of your life. Like I said before, I don't, I don't want to repeat myself. But people do that. People do that in permanent marriage. People do that in zawaj and mutab, temporary marriage. Marriage can always be abused. No matter what you're talking about, anything, just because something is halal, it doesn't mean it's, it's perfect. It's like, you know, you can't abuse it. Of course you can. You can abuse anything and everything you want in religion. So, Shadi, so, just, just quick, I, I, I've, got, I've just got some questions sure. uh, from some people. So I just wondered if you could quickly respond to them. Uh, okay. Number one, do you need permission from the guardian uh, of a girl? Because I know there's a difference of opinion on this issue. For example, if the girl's a virgin, if she's not a virgin, you need permission from her guardian, meaning her father or whoever, you know, whoever look after her. So, According to Sistani, he says that if the girl does not have her things in order, first of all, if she's a virgin, she can do it. Uh, when, you, when we say virgin, we just don't mean, oh, a virgin. No, we mean she's a girl who has no experience with life. She doesn't know what she's doing with herself. She's out of high school. She's this, she's that. She's a child still. You need the father's permission, according is to say. Is that with all cases? Because I understand it may be a slight difference of opinion whether or not. There is difference of opinion, but the majority, because okay. say is Sistani, sure. he is the considered the, the relied upon person. Um, sure. You know, when it comes to the masses of the Shia, we follow Sayyid Sistani. Okay. Now, we can debate about law. We can debate, does, nine year, does a nine-year-old really reach puberty, according to our, our narrations? You can debate that. You mm -hmm. can say, well, maybe the imams meant when she menstruates, and nine years old was the common age. There's mm -hmm. debates about that. People, mm -hmm. some maraja, they say that, no, nine years old is not the age. She has to menstruate. Some maraja say no. Mm -hmm. Just because... the. Uh, uh, a particular opinion is popular it doesn't mean that it is always the case sure. it depends okay. on number yeah, two contract. does the contract need to be written or can it be oral like can either uh, or either or it can be either way yeah okay either way That's right. um just a couple more questions uh can a woman do muta with two guys at the same time and if she can what are the regulations uh, or is this something which is totally forbidden no all the rules that are with permanent marriage are the same as temporary marriage. So no, she can't, she can't do that. And another thing, like I said before, who's going to be the father? That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. It's to protect the society from illegitimate children. It's mm -hmm. to protect the society from men mm -hmm. who aren't raising their kids correctly, who aren't taking responsibility for their children. If the West wants to, if the West utilized muta marriage, which by the way, they do, uh, they do utilize uh, elements of muta marriage. Hmm. They, 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 they utilize the fact that, you know, financial support, for example, taking care of your child, DNA tests, things like that. That all has to do with what muta, is a temporary marriage came to protect. No one is telling you, go ahead and do muta. Hmm. No one is telling you that. We, we actually, permanent marriage is something beautiful and you should do it. 
But if you are in a situation where you can get married, you don't mm -hmm. have the means to get married, you're mm -hmm. a college student, for example, uh, you, you don't have the ability to even leave your house or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you want to be with a girl, mm -hmm. have a responsible relationship where you are obliged to take care of her and the child, you can make that contract mm -hmm. as long as she knows what she's doing. If mm -hmm. not, you have to go to the father. Why do we say that? We say that because no father is going to just say, okay, here you go, take her. No, that's the point. The point isn't just, the point is, oh, the father's going to allow her. No, the point is, no father is just going to say, okay, here you go. Because we know he's going to say no. Hmm. That's a part of it. Unless, unless there's a specific situation where, for example, there's an engagement. We don't have engagement in Islam. What do we have? We have temporary marriage. She puts, the father puts in the contract, you don't touch my daughter until permanent marriage. You know, but you can sit next to her by yourself. You can watch movies. You can take her on a date. You can mm. do this. You do that within the conf confounds of the contract. Mm. Now, uh, any other questions? Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, can I just can I just touch on something? Go ahead, bro. How, dare you, how dare you lie and interrupt me? No. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, birthday boy. So, okay. I um, so touching on the whole thing regarding the father and stuff. I think it's uh, and. There was a comment made in the, uh, the comment section of this live stream by Sarah. So hopefully Sarah is listening or if he's not doing what he said he was doing, he can tune in or whatever. If someone could tag him later, it would be very uh, beneficial. So he said that he's going to go off and do whatever, no contract needed. So the reason why the, the, the good thing about having a, the concept of a, a, a temporary contract is not so much for yourself, you as a secular person, you might be engaging in something with someone else. You don't feel like you need a contract and stuff like this. But you've got to think about if you had a daughter, right? And you lived in this, kind of, in, in this society, right? So the contract is more so what you would want for your own daughter. I remember when I did the, even my permanent contract, I made sure that there was conditions put in the contract that I would make sure my daughters had put in their contract, right? I made sure that there were certain things that would give the woman... Uh, who was my wife, they <laughs> give her certain liberties that she wasn't necessarily entitled to in the very beginning, right, or it, as, as, a, as, a, as a default, because I would want the same for my daughters. And so the, hence, hence the reason why with the temporary contract concept is you would want the same for your, the woman that you're engaging in a, a contract with as you would want for your daughter, your sister, your mother, any woman, you should be treating all women as the exact, as the same. You should be having, you'd be lifting up to the same status. But this is the thing, people only think about themselves and they don't think about what's going to happen further on down the line or when they're in a certain situation. You know what I mean? We're like, oh, well, I don't have to have a, a contract with, you know, your imaginary God. I can just, you know, tell them if you're going to do this, I'm going to do this. Well, this way the entire society can get behind you and actually support the concept. You know what I mean? If you go off and just let your daughter just go around and screw everyone, right, or anyone she wants, and then the community itself isn't going to even back you up. But if you do it in the name of God and you put down that there's, there's stipulations to it and et cetera, at least there's some ground of, uh, that shows that the person she's engaging with at least has the respect and the recognition to uh, apply to uh, uh, comply. You know what I mean? So, the, the, yeah. I didn't want to interrupt you, but I just want to quickly wrap this up. Because I've got a couple of more questions here, so I'm gonna sure. quickly respond to them myself. I'm not gonna take up uh, any more of Shadi's time. Uh, do you need a witness for the contract or the verbal agreement? Um, no, you don't. You don't. You I don't. just want one thing. Though, I want to add to that. If okay. she wants to, she can. She Hi. can even put a thousand witnesses if she wants to. No problem. Okay. Yeah. Um, how does muta compare to uh, boyfriend girlfriend relationships? We kind of dealt with that. Um, obviously, the whole idea is to stop you from sinning. Uh, it can be a you know as a means of prevention from you know uh, that particular individual. Perhaps that uh, particular individual is inclined towards uh, uh, you know a gender uh, being sexually attracted to the same gender. So it could potentially stop them sinning or going towards or leading towards a sin. So that kind of deals with the aspect about how does it stop from you know general girlfriend uh, girlfriend relationship. And by the way, you know, let's be realistic in the secular system. You know, there's no really. There's nothing to really stop a, a, a guy pregnant, you know, uh, making his girlfriend pregnant and dumping her the next day. There's no real means of, you know, offering type protection that way. Um, does a man need to seek permission from his wife for temporary marriage? Again, there's a slight difference of opinion on this issue. 
Um, I believe, I think, Sayyid Sistani, um, he says you do. Uh, on the other hand, there are some other scholars who say it's not a, a requirement um, for uh, the man to seek permission. The reason being is uh, he's not doing anything which is haram. You know, if you don't need a, a halal, stif- halal certificate to go and eat a halal, halal burger. So Can I also like, add to that? I'm yeah. sorry. I just want to make sure. Uh, sure. The reason why he's, he's standing says that is because if any if anything harms co- comes to the relationship nowadays, if yeah. you were to do that, it would destroy the family relationship. So then, yeah. yes, you wouldn't be able to do it unless you ask your wife for, for yeah. permission. Yeah. So I mean, his that's his, yeah. Yeah, of course that's his that's his reasoning. But again, there is a difference of opinion on this, um, and uh, it's it's not much different to taking on a second wife for permanent marriage. Mm-hmm. Who could be a, either a Jew or Christian? Uh, Brother Dan, I understand you in a hurry to shoot off, so we'll let you go, inshallah. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add one quick thing. Yeah, like, sure. there's a uh, narration in Al Kafi on the in the Muta section that actually says that um, it's not recommended. It's like it's not a, saying that it's haram, but uh, I don't know which Imam. I think Imam Sadiq alayhi is saying okay. that uh, if you have a permanent wife, then I don't recommend you to engage in Muta, as you would otherwise. Um, turn your wife uh, against us <laughs> because maybe the the wife would be upset if her husband is heavy, having <laughs> much muta <laughs> and then maybe she would say oh that's because of his school he's falling and maybe it's um, because of the imam but um at the bottom line um there are narrations that say it's not recommended if you already have a permanent wife yeah. Okay, so uh, guys, I'm going to inshallah wrap it up. I just wanted to say um, to the viewers as well that, you know, thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, I'm going to finish off the show with some uh, fatwas. And the reason being is that, you know, let's be realistic. You know, our opponents, you know, they've made a major blunder by arguing that, you know, uh, sh- Shias, uh, you know, they legitimize uh, immorality uh, by claiming that, you know, Nikal Muta is something which is deemed permissible. Right. So, you know, in this show, obviously, we've discussed so far that there's no doubt that, you know, muta is not something which is immoral. Uh, rather, it stops, you know, immorality uh, uh, and it stops a person uh, to leading to their own destruction. Um, and this is something which can be established, obviously, from a, a Islamic point of view. Uh, we discussed the verses of the Holy Quran. We discussed how uh, it was something which was permitted by Holy Prophet and peace and blessings be upon him. It was something. Uh, that was permitted by some of the righteous Sahaba, may Allah be pleased with them, and of course, the Ahl al-Bayt al um, But what amazes me is, you know, why we have certain extremists, um, you know, who consider Shia, you know, jurisprudence, Shia fiqh to be something disgusting, when, you know, their own fiqh uh, is absolutely is vile. Um, and some of the, dis, you know, some of these sexual perversions that are found in their own books, um, I just want to give you some examples, actually. Uh, inshallah, I'm going to read it out for the viewers, and I allow the viewers to decide whether they're in any position to, you know, take the moral uh, high ground with us. So let's have a look at what type of uh, muta, what type of pleasure they enjoy uh, in their lives. So these are from the books of uh, rulings, uh, from the books of jurisprudence. So it's not even a matter of hadith here being authentic or weak. These are the fatwas given by their scholars, by the heads of the scholars. So firstly is the, the, the passage about hiring prostitutes. Uh, in the fiqh jurisprudence, um, it's permitted to hire women. So uh, Al-Nadam, who is a famous uh, jurist, Hanafi jurist, uh, in his book, Fatwa al-Hindiya, um, in, the, in the Arab world is known as Fatwa al-Hindiya, um, in the indo pak countries is known as uh, Fatwa al-Alamgiri, uh, which is a Hanafi book, and it says if a man hires a woman to fornicate with her or have sex with her, or he says, take this money to have sex with me, or says, submit to me for sex for this much money, and she agreed to it, he's not punished. So isn't it funny that these are the same people who say, oh, what well, is that prostitution? Well, hold on a second. Is it? Really? But in your own fic, you, there's no punishment for a person who actually hires a prostitute and sleeps with them. So how can you have an issue with considering muta to be a form of prostitution when it's something which is deemed lawful in your fiqh? And this is from um, a one of their legal scholars. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, the same scholar, um, 
uh, just a different print of uh, Al Fatwa Al Hindiya, Volume 1, page 283. And this is similar to what Brother Daniel was mentioning earlier about uh, marriage with the intention of divorce, but you don't disclose the time period. And he says, if he, a man, married a lady, but it was his intention, meaning he didn't disclose it, the time period, to be with her for only a particular period uh, and leaves her after that duration, even so, the marriage is correct. The such a marriage is correct where you deceive a woman, trick her, and then later leave her. Uh, this is also the opinion of uh, Ibn Abidin from the Hanafi Madhab, who was the Al Mushtahad Al Mu'atamid in the Hanafi Madhab, which is the largest Sunni school. He says, um, if you wish to marry a girl, you can uh, hide the fact that you're, you're going to divorce her later. You don't have to reveal it. And then later on, you can just leave her for no well, and he also says there's no re you can leave a girl for no reason at all you yeah. can divorce her for no reason so it miss it comes from this that's where it comes from and like i said this is the the al mujtahid al mu'tamid and the relied upon legal scholar within the largest sunni school in the world yeah well bin Baz said that didn't he he said himself he doesn't even consider as lying to deceive a woman um but you know, let's let's just continue, inshallah. Um, and he carries on further, and he says, if he married her upon the condition of divorce after a month, um, then this is permissible, meaning that he can marry her for you know he can make the he can make the intention he's only marrying her for a month, and then he can leave her after that month. Um, this is quite an interesting one, actually. If a woman claimed that she is married to a man, and presented evidence before a judge who ruled in her favour. Even though in reality they're not married, in such a case, it's allowed for the man to have sexual relations with her. So this could be a woman, she could really be in some type of marriage relationship, and she can just go to some judge, and she could say, right, this is a guy who could be a, somebody who she's cheating with, her boyfriend or whoever, and that judge must accept the viewpoint of that woman. And by the way, they also accept a testimony of a, a drunk person as well on the issue of related to marriage but today i'm not going to present that uh, maybe i'll save that for another time again this is from uh, al muhalla uh, the famous uh, author ibn hazan and he mentions uh, a very disturbing fatwa and he says and it's been narrated from abu hanifa that the punishment of fornication is dropped if the man murders the woman afterwards so if a man, you know, hypothetically fornicates with a woman, rapes her, or does God knows what, if he kills her, according to the Hanafi Mazhab, there's no punishment on such a person. And Ibn Hazm quotes, he, Ibn Hazm commentates, and he says, it's not been heard anything more odd and then this catastrophe, uh, ca catastrophic, uh, I can't get the words on math, catastrophic verdict, that if someone fornicates, he should be punished. But if he adds to the great sin of fornication, the great sin of murder, that Allah Almighty is really forbidden. The punishment of fornication is dropped. Then he says, we dissociate our souls from such a verdict and praise him uh, much for keeping us away of that and we seek his support. And that's from uh, Ibn Hazm's fam famous book, uh, Al Muhalla, page question number 2216, page number 2139. So as you can see, the way to get away with uh, fornication is basically killing the woman after. Okay. And again, these are major books um, which you can read up their works uh, after. Um, again, another fatwa, uh, and this is for you know uh, an individual. Uh, a bath is not required after having sex with dead people and babies. Okay, this is an extremely disturbing fatwa. Al Nidam in his same same book of fatwa Al Fatwa Al Hindiya, Volume One, Page Fifteen, he says, and penetrating an animal or a dead body and a child that cannot bear penetration does not make ghusl, meaning of the bath, obligatory if he does not ejaculate. So if a man penetrates an animal or a dead person or a child, it doesn't make his bath obligatory. And as mentioned in Al-Mohid, uh, but the correct opinion is that if he's able to penetrate a small child in the place of, I'm not going to read that, it's disturbing. You can go back and read it, but as you can see, uh, the scholars have even said that, look, you're not even required to have a bath when you penetrate animals, dead people, and children. 
Um, and there's the Stanford Review to go back and have a look. And remember, people, these are the same people who try to take the moral high ground when it comes to Muta. Muta should be laughed to your worries, especially when you endorse such type of filthy things that are permitted in your uh, in, in your school of uh, jurisprudence. And um, again, another fatwa. This is Fatwa Kazihan, Volume Three, Page Three Eight One. Uh, this is another famous Hanafi book of uh, fiqh, and according to the, the opinion of Abu Hanifa, you know, that not subject to punishment if they marry uh, a, a media uh, uh, um, member who, for example, the aunt, the sister, um, the grandmother, who we would, would consider such type of marriages to be haram. Uh, but according to Abu Hanifa, such an individual is not subject to uh, punishment. Okay, again, another one really quickly for the viewers. Uh, they consider it uh, permitted in their school of thought. Uh, it says, um, Shahbab al Din al Hamawi, uh, Ibn Najim said, if an individual during Salah looks at a copy of the Quran and reads from it, then his Salah becomes void. But not if he looks at the vagina of a woman with lust. So if a man prays, his salah, is, his, his, his salah becomes void if he looks at a manuscript of the Quran. But if he looks at a woman's vagina with lust, no problem, it's fine. These are the same people who try to take the moral high ground when it comes to uh, muta. But look what type of disgusting sex this is. What type of fit this is. It, should, should, you, really, are you guys worried about muta? You, this should be last of your worries. And this is from the book uh, Shar Kitab al uh, Ashba wa al Nadar, volume 4, page number 286. Again, the scan is there for the viewers. You can always go back, read the works, find out who these authors are. Um, okay, so this is another fatwa. Um, and this is uh, if, a, if a man ejaculates looking at a vagina. So let's just say this guy now is looking at this vagina with lust while he's praying. According to them, even if a person goes for Hajj, it's not a problem if this person ejaculates. So the same, again, Al-Fatwa Al-Hindiya, Volume 1, page 244. Uh, same author, Al-Nizam, and he says, if a person during Hajj or Umrah looks at a woman's private parts with lust, causing ejaculation, then there's nothing upon him to compensate. Meaning a man who, uh, who basically ejaculates uh, and he looks at a woman's private parts. I don't know what type of Hajj these people have, honestly. I swear to God. Normally, a Hajj is a place where you know people become pure and that these are the last things we should be worrying about. Um, but again, maybe who knows? The Salah is strange, the Hajj is strange. Um, this is another disturbing fatwa. Again, another Hanafi jurist, and he says that it's recorded in the Muraj al Dariya. And even if the male organ of a donkey is cut off, uh, and if it was to go inside the female, her Hajj would be void because of intercourse. However, if the organ, meaning if the penis of the animal is wrapped with a cloth, and enters the female, and she uh, doesn't feel the, and if he would find the heat and lust of the female organ, it would be void. And if there was not so, then it would be spite. In other words, if the female doesn't, uh, if, if the female doesn't feel the warmth of that, uh, disgusting, if the female doesn't feel the warmth of the animal's private parts inside her, then her hajj is fine. These are the salahs they have, these are the hajjs they have, these are the top prayers they have, and this is from the book Bahar al Rahab Shar Kanzal uh, I believe, volume 3, page number 26. There's a scan again for the viewers. Um, I'm just going to read them very quickly because I can be here all day just reading how, you know, this, this disturbing type of fatwas they have. Again, masturbating uh, during fasting, that's allowed for them. Sex toys. Um, I'm just going to read the main part here. Um, if I'm, look, okay. So, Ibn Hakila Hanbali, it's been narrated from Ahmed about a man who's afraid that his testicles split due to the pressure of the rut or due to the overflow of semen during Ramadan. Uh, he can release the semen, but he's not, uh, he has not mentioned how he should, uh, man can release it. So he uh, gives a solution, Ibn Josia, uh, Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziya. He says, what I think is that he can release the semen without ruining the fast by masturbating using, using his hands or the hands of his wife. Then he says, if he has a slave girl, whether it be a girl or a little child, a little child, he can masturbate using her hands. And if she was a non-believer, he can have intercourse with her in other than her vagina, meaning what? Meaning her anus. 
something which they consider to be haram. But of course, when it comes to non-believing women, they have no issues penetrating the vaginas or looking at them with lust and ejaculating and all sorts. But anyway, uh, and this is uh, from uh, Ibn Qayyim's uh, Joji's book, um, uh, Badai al Fawaid, volume four, page number 1473. Um, uh, just got a couple more left. I apologize to the viewers for these fatwas. They're disturbing, but it's necessary. They need to be read. And it's important our viewers understand what type of uh, people we're actually dealing with. Um, and they're absolutely in no position to take the moral high ground when it comes to sexual ethics because they need to look at closer to home. Uh, again, same the similar uh, scholar about who talks about uh, masturbation, uh, Ibn Qayyim or Josie, he mentioned Ibn Akil Hanbali. But if you look further, he mentioned how the women can sexually satisfy themselves. And he says, and if a woman had no husband and the temptation grew stronger, it's said by some of the companions, meaning their scholars, that it's permiss permissible for her to hold a an, a, uh, an object which you could say is, is similar to um, a dildo, uh, and she can use the dildo, or um, she can use the cucumbers. Uh, and I, you remember, I don't know if you guys, viewers, remember, but some months ago, there was a big fatwa in Saudi about women not being permitted to purchase uh, cucumbers and stuff because they were afraid that they were going to use it, uh, you know, for whatever reason. So yeah, you know, these are the type of sexual perversions that are allowed in the religion. Um, again, adult breastfeeding, those who are familiar to it, um, and this is again, it's a hadith from Muslim Ahmed ibn Hanbal, uh, and it's narrated on the authority of Aisha. The tradition is uh, authentic by the uh, anointer, uh, sh sh um, Ahmed Shakir, and he says, that um, and look, this is an extremely disturbing narration, by the way, because these people talk about you know protecting the honor of the wives of the prophet. They always say, "Oh, you Shia, you son of the wives of the prophet, etc., etc." Which is not true. Um, but have a look at this narration, which they attribute to Aisha. Aisha took uh, a precedent for whatever man she wanted to uh, able to come to see her. She ordered the daughters of her sisters and her brothers to give milk to whichever men she wanted to able to come uh, in to see her. The rest of the wives of the Prophet, may peace and blessings be uh, upon him, refused to let anyone come in, uh, into them by such nursing. They said, no, by Allah, we think that what the Messenger of Allah, may Allah blessings be upon him, ordered Sahil bin Suhail, and that's talking about a particular narration in their works and say Muslim, we don't accept that, but according to them, they believe that this was an exception where the Prophet, may peace and blessings be upon him, um, Astaghfirullah, may God forgive me for uttering these words, he allowed a adult male uh, to be uh, breastfeed uh, from uh, uh, a woman, a fully grown woman. And this narration, and uh, Sh uh, Shaheen Lashin, who is a very famous Egyptian um, scholar, I think he's uh, one of the heads of Al Azhar University, and he elaborates further on this tradition. And he says, Aisha, I mean, Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, Umm al um, she uh, believed. The adult breastfeeding makes an individual mahram, meaning that once a female uh, breastfeeds uh, somebody, that person uh, becomes unlawful for marriage. Uh, like they become like a relationship, like a brother of some kind, or even a son, you could say, or, or father, uncle. He says, Aisha uh, believed that adult breastfeeding makes an individual mahram, and she practically breastfed a young man, and he would enter upon her. But the remainder of the mothers of the believers denied it. And this is from Fatul al Mormon, Shar Say Muslim, volume 5, page number 622. And this is again problematic. These are not our books, these are your books, your scholars who've given these fatwas. Um, and again, we, we can ask, you know, how is it possible even that the wife of the Prophet even gave milk, especially when we know that she was never pregnant during her lifetime? So this is how they honor the religion with these extremely vile, disgusting, filthy fatwas. They talk about mota being a form of pleasure, uh, pleasure in marriage, when you, the reality is you people are seeking pleasures in uh, all sorts of uh, different ways. And that's it. I apologize for taking up too much time, guys. I'll pass it back to you. Wait, Hassan. Hey, Hassan, you there with us? I'm there, sorry, yeah. I think that kind of concludes things uh, for the evening, doesn't it? Um, I, I, the, uh, the intention that we had actually to bring it to a wider audience, this topic, because it's such a hot topic, obviously it's been discussed on different forums, it's been discussed at Hyde Park, uh, different channels. We thought it would be useful to essentially we'd bring it to a wider audience, a non-Muslim audience, 
to, to, to judge this topic area, to see, look, if, uh, all this controversy over Muta, A, we will talk about it, its social aspects, its legitimacy under the Sharia, and um, we wanted you to take a decision. Uh, all of the controversy that's been banded about on this topic, is it, re is it really that much problematic? Is it really that controversial? And um, I hope, inshallah ta'ala, that when you listen to what we've said, the arguments that we've put forward, it is a legitimate practice. It was practiced during the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. Um, it continued to be practiced thereafter. There was a body of companions which believed in its le legitimacy after the death of the Prophet. The Al Bayt, the Salatu Wasallam, believed likewise. And it is uh, practiced in this day and age by the Shia of the Al Bayt, alayhi Salatu Wasallam. I think that concludes things for the evening. Wow. Say, Dalit. Absolute wow. Thank you. A magnificent show. I have to just commend the Beit Al Ghadir team for going in and just, just hitting us up with a jam packed amount of information, going through the Shahs, i.e., the commentaries of um, you know, all these great works, um, you know, the tafsirs. Like you don't have really done your due diligence. We're so very much so grateful um, for all the hard work that you guys constantly put in. And I know, I know a lot of our brothers and sisters want to have their say, want to actually, um, you know, challenge the information that's presented. What we're trying to do for this particular show is, is a presentation rather than us going on for four or five hours with, um, you know, different uh, people coming in and having their say. We just want to give the presentation alone, right? And of course, I will invite you guys, um, when we close down, we will invite you guys so you can come on in and have an off-air discussion with the members who choose to stay on. But we're just doing a short presentation tomorrow, okay? We're going to continue this conversation. This is just the appetizer. Tomorrow we're going to have a, a lot more discussions uh, to it. And then if we have even more time, we can continue and we can even have some um, hot dialogue, i.e. some hot debates amongst uh, certain members of the Shia community, the Sunni community, and the non-Muslim community on this particular issue. So please rest assured, um, we're definitely going to get you know the interaction on tomorrow's show. Um, let me just quickly do a big shout out to all of you guys who've been um, dropping donations on the Super Chat. Um, for those of you guys who don't know, um, on the chat section, there is a, uh, you know, there is a place where you can do super chats and so forth. And we are very always grateful for those people who keep up, keep us afloat, keep us, uh, show, keep showing love to Titans TV. Um, you know, Jay Boogie, shouts out to you. Shouts out to Ultra Fun KKK, who's always up in the building. And Ali Al Hassan, okay, my brother, uh, has dropped a powerful um, donation and also says here, Big up bit al -Ghadir. keep presenting and, sorry, keep representing and presenting the tree, true Islam of Ahlu Bayt. Kala. God Kala. bless you. Thank, you. thank you for everything today as well. Um, I was going to say that, please make sure you get the brothers to, obviously not only like and subscribe to uh, Titans TV, but give us a like and subscribe and share as well. Um, and we've got so many shows at the moment on our channel on a variety of topics. Uh, we've not even started yet, and just as we present these type of um, documentations for the viewers to, to go out and read and research, we do exactly the same thing on our channel as well. So. That's right. So, family members, let me just quickly get you guys to see. Here we go. Actually, no. Can I do it like this? Application window? Uh, all right. So... Uh, you guys, if you haven't been on the Beit al Gader's channel, this is it right here, all right? Beit al Gader's channel. Um, hit the subscribe button, okay? Hit the subscribe button, and then, of course, hit the notification button. As you can see, my notification has already been hit already, okay? So I, I, I stay up to date with what's going on with my brothers. Um, so, yeah, yeah, go check it out. You know, some real good, powerful information over here on the Beit al Gadir's um, channel. So please hit the subscribe button on their channel. And of course, just underneath their videos, um, you know, if there's anything that you disagree with, and I'm pretty sure some of you guys are coming from a sunny background, um, so you may disagree with a lot, please just, just make your comments, right? And do comments that are not just like, ah, uh, you 
this. Ah, you calf a dog. You that. You eh, 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 eh. Don't do the nonsense one, right? Please don't do the nonsense one. I read those comments all day long and I just like, ah, I'm bored of those things, right? I want, you know, this channel has been literally here geared to breed critical thinkers, okay? It's here to breed critical thinkers. So if you disagree with something and we want you to disagree, we don't want you just to simply be yes men or, or, or yes women. We want you to disagree because the more that you disagree is the more, um, you know, you yourself and us ourselves have an opportunity to actually advance our level of knowledge and our uh, ability of understanding and our education on certain topics, okay? We want to be better. We want to come to uh, the truth. And we could only come to the truth when there, once there is contention. You know what they say? Like in, 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 in business itself, like you could only become better as uh, you know, a business person or your, your company itself if there is competition. Right, so we need people to actually challenge our ideas, critique our uh, presentations. All right, so in that way, you yourself can learn something. You yourself can go uh, back and do the research. Was it really accepted? Was Muta something that was, you know, accepted according to um, uh, Ibn Jubir? Was it accepted according to Ibn Abbas? Was it accepted? according to uh, Ubay ibn Qab, okay? Was it accepted by these powerhouses? These are like the the, the, ulema, ulema, the, 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 the big boys. These are the big boy scholars um, in early Islam. Like, was it really accepted during their time? Like, question this. Are the brothers simply lying to you? I'm not saying that they are lying to you, by the way, but I want you to have that kind of, uh, that, that, that thought pattern. No, they're lying to me. Because the moment that you actually go back and you do the research, right? and you can see the source material, you can see the hadith, you can see the Qurans, you can see the commentaries, you can see the tafsirs, and then it may just um, allow you to change your perception, change your opinion upon this particular topic and advance your own reasoning um, capabilities on this topic itself. And all for the non-Muslims, right? I, I learned some very powerful, um, how can I put it, uh, you know, how can I put it? I learned some very powerful tactics itself, like or, or strategies itself that you can actually implement. And I think I will teach my children, my daughters, to actually, when you you know engage in a relationship with 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 a man, you know you need to be for you need to have foresight. You need to actually think about the repercussions of your actions. Think of the best way you can preserve yourself and protect yourself and uh, your potential children and protect your your relationship with the man itself. I think these are some excellent, um, you know, ideas that we've currently just been exposed to. For those of you guys who may not be aware of these types of topics, and hopefully you lot kind of came away with something. I hope you lot did come away with something. That's what I'm about to say. All right? Um, I'm gonna let my 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 brothers sign out and just drop any last words if they have any. Uh, let Ryan wrap it up. Ryan, you still there? Um, shout out to everyone that came and uh, checked this uh, share out, even the haters. Gotta love you guys. Um, thanks to the other guys that are on the panel. Big ups to Callum for having us on. Greatly appreciate it as usual, bro. Love your work. Um, yeah, I can't wait to see what other people have to say about this. <laughs> That's about it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, family, we're out. And of course, I'm going to drop the link to you guys who um, who have been tuned in. I know, uh, you know, my brothers are going to be here for a little bit longer. Um, so if some of you guys want to come in real quickly, the link has been sent, but we are going straight off air. Peace and love, family. And I'll see you guys on the other side. Oh, man.